Hello, welcome to International Finance. My name is Matthew Winter. I'm thrilled to be teaching this class. I love international finance. My PhD is in finance. The first paper that I published looked at international questions. My entire dissertation was inter is international. I've published international work. I do a lot of international research. I study how companies behave all around the world, how investors move money in between markets. So this is something that I'm thrilled to teach. My office hours are gonna be from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. via Zoom. Email is matthew.winter at stonybrook.edu. Email is gonna be the best way to get in contact with me. Should you need anything, just reach out. The course webpage. So everything is gonna be uploaded on Blackboard. What are you gonna find there? You're gonna find the course announcements, our lecture notes, our problem sets, solutions, Excel, case materials, everything. Everything is gonna be on Blackboard. What are the materials? So there is a required course textbook. This is the McGraw-Hill book. Uh, the electronic or international copies are perfectly okay. Older copies are perfectly okay. This is really so you can have something to supplement my lecture notes. There are gonna be homework sets. So these will be individual. The intention is for you to practice and apply the material so no one gets lost along the way. We'll also have problem sets and case studies. So you'll do Excel problems, you'll retrieve data, you'll perform analysis. You can access the relevant materials on the course page. And you'll also use real data to produce professional memo for your final project. The case link for the Harvard business case study that you'll need is again on the syllabus. What's expected of you? Do the readings, work through the problems. There are suggested but not required material like a financial podcast, for example. The indicator from Planet Money is like a 10 minute podcast, comes out daily. It does a good job of discussing different economic and financial relevant material. What's expected of you? Readings, so chapters from a book, handful of news articles that I will post, homework sets, your lowest homework set is gonna get dropped, so don't worry about it. Problem sets, these are the things you'll work in in your study groups after the drop ad deadline, I'll put you into study groups. You'll have a case study and a memo. And again, the problem sets, your case study and your memo, these are all gonna be submitted within your group, but make sure you can still understand how to do the questions yourself. And obviously, please be compliant with the honor code. Don't put me in a position to do something that I don't want to do. All right. What tools will we be using? We're going to be using finance. We're going to discount cash flows, NPV. We're going to look at capital budgeting decisions, pricing stocks, options, all of it. We'll also be applying accounting statistics. We're going to apply stat. So you will do regression analysis. But more generally, when we think about expected return, that's our mean, that's our average. A very easy way to measure risk is going to be with the standard deviation. And then we'll always be thinking about how things co-vary. How do they move together? How do they correlate? Why? Well, if I'm holding stock in country A and I'm holding stock in country B, I want to know how those two are going to co-move together. So how can I diversify? All of this is going to be built on top of a foundation of economics. So we use supply and demand asymmetric information, competition between firms, investors, all of it, to try to understand this international setting. What can you expect of me? You can expect that I will try my best to make sure you get a high return on your investment. That doesn't mean I'm gonna ensure that everybody gets a high grade, but it does mean that I will give you all of my effort to make sure that you can understand this material. The goal, is for you to take the very interesting phenomenon that we'll discuss and be able to apply it outside of the classroom. So if it's a job, an interview, an internship, dinner with a grandparent, anything, I want you to be able to explain what is happening in today's market or today's economy, what's going on globally, because that's what you'll be asked to do when you go on from here. So ask plenty of questions via email, during my Zoom office hours. If there's something you don't understand, reach out and we can try to get you uh, sorted. Okay, so what is this course about? 
core concepts of the international financial system. So your first lecture will go through the time value of money and valuations. We'll really spend some time to make sure that we all are on the same page in terms of solving our valuation equations, because then we'll use those tools to apply them to different international settings. We'll also go through some of the mechanics of foreign exchange. So you'll look through the international monetary system. We'll discuss Brexit, which was a very recent episode of a conscious uncoupling between a country and a currency system. We'll look at the capital account, the current account, basically how do you keep track of the trade of financial assets, the trade of real physical assets and services. And then we'll also take a while to make sure we understand how tariffs and how trade are these settings that are very much tied to our international financial system. Once we understand the international financial system, we'll shift to managers and then investors. So for managers, we're gonna ask, what are the firm's financial decisions? We'll start with corporate governance. We really want to understand who runs the firm and what are, our, what are the agency concerns or the conflicts between shareholders or between shareholders and debt holders or between shareholders and managers. What are the different conflicts that are going to affect how the firm is governed? We'll also look at financial options and derivatives more generally. So we'll spend quite a bit of time to make sure you understand what a forward versus a future is and how those are distinct from options. And then we'll use all of that to figure out how we should hedge risk, what are investment strategies, given our expectation of how markets will perform if we look at the derivative market versus the spot market. And then lastly, we'll talk quite a bit about real options and foreign direct investment. Real options are basically the option to expand an investment, the option to abandon an investment, and it's a good way for us to understand how firms will make strategic decisions to basically enter new markets or to do something along those lines. Lastly, we will also spend some time to go through the cost of capital. And then lastly, uh, home bias to kind of round out our discussion of corporate. Home bias and cost of capital are also kind of, um, they're kind of on the borderline with the investment stuff we'll talk about next. So strategy, how do investors make international financial decisions? The name of the game is diversification. So we'll build beta, we'll calculate expected returns, we'll use correlation to figure out how our assets are moving together across countries, and our goal will be to ultimately lower our discount rate. We want to lower our cost of capital. We want to lower our required return as an investor. So we'll try to figure out how to reduce our risk such that we can lower our required return. In all of this, we'll think about market segmentation. So twin shares and cross listings are ways that firms deal with the inability to access foreign investors given that investors are home biased. Home bias is a really fancy way of saying that people really don't hold as much foreign securities as any of our models would predict. We'll then test different investment strategies using the CAPM and international factor models. We'll try to assess whether managers have skill, how they're forming portfolios, what they're investing in. And it'll be a good way for us to understand the limits to arbitrage. And hopefully time permitting, we can get into some different foreign exchange investment strategies. So what makes international finance interesting? Well, many things. First, countries can have different currencies, economic policies, taxes, investor bases, and so many differences across countries. Those differences across countries kind of are gonna present some of the key features of our international setting. The first is gonna be foreign exchange risk. Because we have these differences in economic and political situations all around the world, we're also going to have differences in how currencies appreciate and depreciate against one another. That movement in currencies is going to present a risk to us, either as financial managers or as investors. So we'll want to understand foreign exchange risk. There's also going to be a bevy of market frictions across countries. So we have agency concerns. Agency concerns are basically, I worry that the person I've hired may not be working on my behalf. I also 
I'm going to have information asymmetry, especially within an, within an international setting. So it's going to be harder for me to have personal connections, harder for me to have local informal ties to gather this information to figure out whether the company really is doing what it says it is, or if the managers are really good managers or bad managers, it's gonna be harder for me to deal with this information asymmetry. Also across countries, we have different tax treatments, different tax policies. And then lastly, we have different bankruptcy codes. It's really difficult to enforce creditor rights across a border. So because of that, we're gonna have frictions in how even our debt is gonna be supplied and raised across country. All of this is gonna to lead to different opportunities. So the same way how these market frictions can limit our opportunities, they can also present expanded opportunities. So we'll talk about how companies can take advantage of that through the product market. And the big focus for us will be on the capital market. So diversification, we keep using this term. Why are we using this term? What am I showing you? I'm showing you that the market capitalization the level of stocks that are traded, and also the economic growth of Argentina, Germany, and Japan, all vary considerably across countries. So given that we have such differences in the size of the capital market, the way in which investors trade in this market, and the actual economic growth of these different countries, logically, there's gonna be differences in how these capital markets are performing. Those differences across countries for us present the opportunity to diversify. So now that we kind of have some sense of just how varied our markets are across the world, let's take it a step further to understand how our companies are also gonna vary. So when we talk about our corporate structure, we'll start with our stakeholders. We have our stakeholders, which are gonna be any person, group or organization or system, anyone that's affected by the firm. We move further in and then we have our investors. So this is gonna include basically anybody that supplies capital to the firm, our shareholders and our debt holders. And in the innermost circle, we have our shareholders who actually have control rights of the firm. So the investors have cash flow rights, but the shareholders have control rights. They can vote. They can decide how the company operates. Why is this so interesting? Well, you can see that we have many different types of stakeholders. And depending upon the country in which we operate, the values and the systems of that country, our stakeholders might have more influence or less influence, and all of that varies. So it's going to lead us to have different goals or different objectives when we're trying to identify how the firm should be managed and how the firm should be ran. So let's take a look at our owners. Our owners are our, our investors. And again, these are the individuals that have cash flow rights, our shareholders and our debt holders. We know the shareholders own stock, i.e. equity, and our debt holders are gonna own bonds or loans, basically IOUs to the company. And their big concern is gonna be credit risk. Will you be able to pay me back? First order concern. The second order concern is inflation. When you pay me back, will this money be worth anything? So what do investors want? We will always assume that our marginal investor is risk averse, meaning that they like higher returns and they don't like risk. So when I say marginal investor, I mean that the person that's buying or selling the stock or the bond, they're going to want higher returns and lower risk. To sort of motivate this idea, we're going to assume that the marginal investor is small, but hold in your mind that within the international context, the marginal investor may be large. They may have a controlling share of the firm, which is going to give rise to something that we call the twin agency problem. What that means is that as a large shareholder, I'm going to run the firm a little bit differently than I would if I was a smaller shareholder that was well diversified. So we'll take a look at that further into the intro. So what do all these assumptions mean? Well, the investor is going to take the risk and return of a security portfolio or market as a given. For example, we're not going to assume that we're in a setting like the foreign direct investment where the investors or the corporation have full corporate control and go to acquire a firm or to build a new plant. 
we're not going to assume that we're activists and our decision is that really, if we just got new managers into the firm, we could increase cash flows, or if we got the firm to move into less volatile industries, we could make our cash flows safer, or if we shifted to countries with less foreign exchange risk, we could basically increase firm value. None of those are corporate decisions we're gonna put on the table. The only thing that we're gonna decide is how much should we hold and whether or not we should hold it. So what can an investor do if you're facing all these different types of risks? Well, truthfully, you can hedge. So what's the first risk that you'll hedge? The first thing that you'll think about is again, your foreign exchange risk. And the key idea is that exchange rates can be volatile. They change quite a bit. So if I'm a risk-averse manager or a risk-averse investor, I'm going to want some kind of way to mitigate this risk. So what I'm showing you is the monthly percentage change in Japanese yen versus the dollar. And you can see it's incredibly volatile. Given the volatility of exchange rates, you would want to hedge them. But remember, there are many other market frictions that will impact your investment. So let's discuss some of those. The first that we'll think about is corporate governance. So because of all of these different conflicts of interest and agency concerns, we'll always be asking ourselves whether our definition as a shareholder or a debt holder or a manager of the firm doing well means the same thing for other stakeholders. Shareholders and employees and managers all have different definitions of how the firm should be performing. Even within shareholders, we'll have different definitions. Again, if I'm a controlling shareholder who has a large stake and I'm a small minority shareholder who has a smaller stake, we're going to want different things. Even within the class of investors, we have different conflicts of interest. So a shareholder might prefer that the firm engage in risky things to increase firm value. If I'm a debt holder and I've loaned the company money, I may want the firm to be safe so it can pay me back my cash flows. It can pay me from its cash flows with less risk. So again, there are going to be differences. There's going to be conflicts of interest. And one thing that we haven't touched on that's going to be very important within the international setting is that we'll also have different communities and governments that will play a role in how we're able to invest and how we're able to operate. So there's many different conflicts of interest that we'll have to figure out as we go through the course. We also have frictions. We have market segmentation. Our product markets and our capital markets are not perfectly integrated. That means that as a firm, it's gonna be hard in some settings for me to go and raise capital from investors that aren't in the country in which I'm domiciled. As an investor, it's gonna be hard in some settings for me to take my money and put it into a company that's not headquartered or listed in the country in which I'm domiciled. And that can be for a number of reasons. It could be because I have limited information. It could be because I have asymmetric information. It could be because I'm worried about the uncertainty of foreign returns. There's many different factors. Also, we know that capital is costly. So as a firm, you may not take all positive NPV investments because you have a hurdle rate. You have an internal rate of return. So the point is that we have these frictions that are going to make within one country it a bit difficult for us to have markets function perfectly well. When we add to that the political risk, the differences in tax regimes, the inability to enforce credit controls across countries, meaning that when the firm enters into financial distress, if I've loaned you money and I'm in a different country, I may have a hard time recouping my payment from you. There's also irreversibility. If you enter into a new market with a foreign direct investment, you acquire a new firm, you may not be able to undo that investment decision. So all of these market frictions are gonna complicate things within an international setting. So what do these frictions do? Well, let's look at the first one. These frictions can clearly affect firm value and spill over to other financial decisions. For example, agency. Because I'm giving you money and I worry that you may not be working on my behalf, I have an incentive to monitor you. 
But if I want to monitor and manage it, it's going to take time, energy, and money, all of which is costly. So who would decide that monitoring is worthwhile? Suppose we have two shareholders, one that has 100K invested and one that has $100 invested. You can imagine that if I have 100K invested in the company, I'm going to think it's worthwhile to pay attention to how these managers are behaving. But if I do have a large share of my wealth invested into the company, I'm also giving up my diversification. So for me, there's going to be a conflict between how I want the firm to perform as a large shareholder. I may want the firm to be less risky, i.e. safer, than the smaller shareholders. So what does that mean? That means that the investments that we make within the firm are gonna have this trade-off. So because of this agency concern, I have an incentive to monitor, but the types of shareholders that have an incentive to monitor are going to be your larger shareholders. Those large shareholders may also want the firm to behave safer than your smaller shareholders. So you can see how these frictions are gonna to lead to a trade-off between firm value, i.e., do I want the firm to have a lower beta? Do I want the firm to have safer cash flows? Or do I want the firm to be riskier, to have a higher beta, to have more volatile cash flows? And we think there's gonna be a trade-off between risk and return. For investors, these frictions can increase risk and limit the opportunity to diversify. A great example are currency devaluations. There are plenty of examples that we'll study of how investors were speculating on different markets where they observed that the market was appreciating super high returns, but a currency devaluation eliminated their returns. We also know that agency concerns can reduce your diversification benefit. Think about the example we just went through. Again, if I'm a shareholder and I'm worried that everybody's gonna steal my money, I'm not gonna invest. And then something we've talked about for our debt holders as well, is that bankruptcy laws are pretty hard to enforce across borders. So that's gonna increase the risk that I face as a debt holder. So what does this mean? It means that when we look across countries, we think that there's a way to mix and match across our capital markets. So what am I showing you? I'm showing you a plot of the average return per month for each of these markets plotted against the standard deviation, the volatility of those monthly returns. And what do you see? You see that there's clearly a trade-off between risk and return. In general, markets that are riskier tend to have higher returns. You can also see that there's a curve when we plot out this efficient frontier we're taking basically the risk-free security and we're forming a portfolio that's mixed and matched all these different countries. So there's two things to know. First, again, clearly a relationship between risk and return. And that feels somewhat intuitive. It's not perfect. You can see that there are some markets that have higher return, lower risk. And that's something that we'll take advantage of when we get into our investment part of the course. Also note, that the way we're defining risk is with standard deviation. And as we progress with the course, eventually we're gonna be using betas. Okay, so let's look at an example, a real world example of how a firm dealt with a market imperfection. This example comes from Nestle. So Nestle used to have two forms of shares. They had shares that Swiss residents had that also came with voting rights. And then they had shares for foreign residents that weren't basically uh, provided with voting rights. On November 18th, 1988, Nestle lifted its restrictions imposed on foreigners, allowing them to hold registered shares as well as these bearer shares. And very quickly, the prices narrowed drastically. So there's two things to point out. First, you can see that before Nestle allowed both Swiss and non-Swiss investors to hold both of these class of shares, that the shares that had voting rights were valued much higher than the shares that did not. So that's why those two lines are different. Second, you can see 
that when they lifted this restriction, the shares converged very quickly. If you're Nestle, that's wonderful because that's gonna lower your cost of capital. So what's the punchline? What's the takeaway? Within this real world example, what you observe is that we have a market that is segmented. And here the segmentation came from a choice of the company. But there are plenty of other settings in which that segmentation will be a function of investor behavior or laws and different things that we'll get into. So Nestle was able to expand its opportunity set financially, and that's important. More generally, when we think about these expanded opportunities, managers can access different capital markets. So you can cross list, you can use euro bonds. Basically, you can raise currency, you can raise, you can raise debt in a country in which you're not domiciled. Almost all, not all, but a lot of these euro bonds are US denominated bonds that are raised outside of the states. You also have access to different banks. So again, we've been talking how it can be difficult to implement credit rights across countries. If I have operations in country A and there's a bank that I like in country A, I can raise capital from them. I can use my operations, my plant as collateral to raise capital from them. And also I can increase my shareholder base. All of this is going to reduce my cost of capital and increase my financial flexibility. Obviously, with our product markets, we know that most U.S. listed companies have international sales and many are going to rely on import and export, which is going to affect their free cash flows and firm value. So very recently, we've seen how there have been a number of supply chain disruptions as a consequence of all of the disruptions that we have with the global pandemic that have had very real effects on firm value. And then lastly, we know that our labor markets and our operations are also segmented across countries. So firms are gonna have many foreign facilities that are gonna engage in foreign direct investment as a way to basically expand and increase firm value through these strategic investments. For investors, this is wonderful. For investors, the expanded opportunity sets mean that you can have assets with different exposure to risk, you can supply capital that have different rights, different enforcements. So if I'm, a, if I'm in a market with relatively weak investor protections, I can invest in markets with stronger investor protections, more diversification, reduces my risk, increases my return. Think back to that cool slide that we saw on slide 19. So what's the goal? Primary objective can be to maximize shareholder wealth. In many countries, the focus is on stakeholders. And again, these are all gonna be different depending upon cultural values, the legal, the enforcement, the protections, all of those vary across countries. Ultimately, we do know that the firm should behave ethically. Of course, we know that firms also have a responsibility to society at large because your shareholders are ultimately also members of society. So our goal is gonna to be to behave ethically and our goal is gonna to be to maximize value, but maximizing value for the firm versus the shareholder, maximizing value for the stakeholders, again, who's to say which is the right way? The way that we generally think about this is by maximizing firm value. So we have free cash flow. Free cash flow is basically what's left over. Once I have my sales, I take away my operating costs, my taxes, my required investments. So whatever other capital expenditures and investments and everything else that I have to make, all the money that's left on the table that can be shoved to my investors are my free cash flows. When we value a firm, we take the present value of these different free cash flows. So what do we have? Our numerator, we have our free cash flow. And in our denominator, we have our WAC, our weighted average cost of capital. And that's gonna be affected by many things. How do we mix our debt and equity? What are our taxes? How willing are investors to take on our risk? How risky is the firm? What are interest rates? All these different things affect it. But the key idea is that if we increase free cash flow, or decrease our cost of capital, our WAC, we're gonna increase firm value. And very clearly through international expansion and access to international capital and goods, 
we can accomplish that. We're going to be able to increase the free cash flow of our firm potentially if we have access to all these different markets, if we can take advantages of differences in labor markets, differences in product markets, all of it. And of course, for our weighted average cost of capital, all things held equal, if we're able to expand our investor base, if we're able to expand our shareholders and our debt holders, we should reduce our cost of capital because the risk is going to be better diversified across our investor base. So the point is that through international finance, our goal is going to be to increase firm value. So let's go through a course outline. First, we'll start with the international financial system. So your next lecture is going to be a refresher on the intro to finance. We'll go through discounting cash flows, amortization, paying off a loan, using the appropriate discount rate, calculating MPV. It'll basically be a review of time value of money and valuation. Once we've done that review, because we're going to be using those tools and applying them over and over and over, so we want to make sure that we're fresh and that we're really uh, remembering all of our different valuation models. We'll take that, we'll go through the background on international finance, and then we'll jump in to an area that hopefully feels familiar. We'll look at the balance of payments. So we'll look at our capital account, trade, recent developments in trade, we'll talk about Brexit, and then we'll move from there to our international monetary system. So with our international monetary system, we'll look at foreign exchange rates, the development of the euro, we'll talk about the Greek, debt, the Greek debt crisis, the Mexican peso crisis, the British crown crisis. We'll talk about these different periods of contagion and how they basically um, kind of help us understand some of the limits to arbitrage and some of the market inefficiencies that can affect us internationally. Once we have a good grounded understanding of how the international system works, we'll move to how companies operate within that system. So first, we'll go through corporate governance, and we'll spend quite a bit of time to understand our agency concerns, our conflicts of interest, and how we have different tools to address them. One of those will be our capital structure, how do we finance ourselves, but there are other tools that we have too, like legal and reporting, so we'll go through different solutions to our agency problem. Next, we'll look at financial derivatives. So we'll make sure that we understand a forward versus a future and how those are distinct from financial options. And we'll use all of these different derivative instruments to manage our exchange rate and commodity risks. The last thing that we'll get into for corporate will be real options of foreign direct investment. And then we'll kind of look at something that sits sort of in between corporate and investment, which is the cost of capital and home buys. Again, we know that our investors really don't diversify as much as we think they should. And that's going to affect the cost of capital because as we've been saying over and over, a bigger investor base, lower cost of capital. So we'll go through portfolio choice and market segmentation. We'll discuss what risk matters to investors. We'll figure that out using factor models. We're going to evaluate the performance of investment models. We'll see how these are predicated on there being limits to arbitrage. And from those limits to arbitrage, we're going to build portfolios and test to see whether those portfolios perform well. If we have time to go through, we'll look at the euro dollar market and we'll discuss the sovereign ceiling, which basically says that for most companies, you can't borrow at rates better than your government. There have been a handful of firms that have pierced the sovereign ceiling, so that's something that we would like to discuss, time permitting. Okay, so we also have plenty of applied topics. We're going to look at all these different decisions that are important. Hopefully, we can talk about mergers and acquisitions when we get into foreign direct investment. And then definitely, we'll be using derivatives as we figure out managing our risk. So we'll be using options, forwards, and futures. Um, and then time permitted, we're definitely covering Brexit. We'll talk a little bit about COVID-19. At the end of the course, if we have time, we can discuss the global financial crisis, kind of help you understand how we got here. So topics this week, the review of the time value of money, you'll go through NPV, annuities, perpetuities, amortization, 
there's a posted um, homework that'll be due that also goes through all of this. And then next week, we're gonna get into the role of the balance of payments. So we'll discuss what a trade deficit means. We'll look at trading goods and financial securities and our current account, our capital account. And our goal is gonna to be to understand how the uncertainty over tariffs and trade limits affect a firm competing with an importer or dependent on exporting. And hopefully a lot of that will be clear as we discuss Brexit. So next lesson is gonna be a time value of money review. The relevant materials are gonna be posted on Blackboard. And then to prepare for next week, please read chapter one again. We're going to get into the balance of payment and some more international financing stuff next week. Very excited to teach you. Please reach out if you have questions or you don't understand anything or, or whatever. Thank you. Bye.